Hi, my name is Frida. Um, I'm from the Grace Hopper 1609 cohort, and tonight I'll be talking about the blockchain and hopefully dis demystifying it a little bit. Um, so the title of my talk is Crypto Consensus, and I chose that because there are a couple different um, ways you could interpret what that means. So the main innovation of the Bitcoin and blockchain technology is the idea of a computer-generated consensus, which is called a distributed consensus. So a lot of different computers um, will look at a piece of code and then try to come to a conclusion about it. And then the term consensus is also like a little bit um, blurred in the application of this technology, um, since a lot of people don't know how to use it yet or like what it's really meant to do. And I'm also going to show an example of a democratic consensus that um, is sort of taken from real life, and we're going to try to recreate that in code. Um, so a little bit of background about Ethereum itself. So Ethereum is similar to Bitcoin. Um, Ether is another type of cryptocurrency. Um, but this technology is a little bit newer. It was first described in 2013. And, and then developed by a, um, a Russian-Canadian developer when he was 20 years old. Um, and now this ecosystem is worth like over a billion. So it's a pretty, pretty big chunk of change. Uh, so what actually is the blockchain? It's actually not either of these two images. So these are visualizations of um, what a centralized and decentralized network are. So a centralized one, you kind of depend on one node for information. And in a decentralized one, um, maybe like Facebook or something, there are lots of different people with different types of information. But a distributed ledger, which is what the blockchain is, information is stored completely on every single node. So it, there's total transparency. Every single person in the network can see all of the information everyone else has. So that actually makes it very secure. Um, so what, what might the blockchain actually look like? So it's probably like a linked list is the closest um, example, but it's the references are a little bit different. So the references are made based on hashes. Um, so a block gets added to the chain if it can solve the problem of the previous block, and that's how the chain builds up, is when miners or people who are contributing to this chain like, are able to solve like, a puzzle from the previous block, and then that block um, gets added onto this chain, and then this chain is replicated across every computer in the network. Um, and a common question is like, where is data in the chain? And Data can be stored on individual blocks, and that might look like a hash table, but it, it's expensive to hold data that way. Um, so what is like consensus in the blockchain? Um, well, every time a block is added, all of the nodes in the network have to agree about if it should be added, if the transaction is valid. Um, so on the very ground, different computers that are a part of this network get to vote on specific contracts, uh, which um, I guess you can think of as like individual transactions, like if I'm going to give another person a certain amount of money. So then um, miners go and try to solve little like algorithmic puzzles, and it, this generates proof of work. So proof of work is something that shows that like more and more computers have come to a consensus about a particular block being on the chain. This embeds um, game theory type of logic to the chain where it becomes really difficult for an attacker to try to alter the state of truth of the whole chain because you would, you would basically have to have more computers and more computational power than everyone else in order to make the entire chain adopt your version of the truth. So consensus for the blockchain boils down to like everyone agreeing on a single source of truth. So uh, you can create 
a D app or a decentralized app using the blockchain. Um, to do so, it's, it's simple, but it's also complex. So you need to require Web3 and write source contracts in a language called Solidity for Ethereum specifically. And so Solidity is a high level language that compi compiles down to bytecode. And it's very similar if you are familiar with JavaScript, like the language of so Solidity is like pretty easy to adopt. Um, so then what happens is you, you generate this information and then you can deploy the contract that you've made onto the Ethereum chain. And actually, here's an example of one. Uh, this is specifically um, like a contract for what a democracy would look like. So in a democracy, maybe like the, the exchange that's happening is a ballot with votes and you have voters, right? So the ballot is the contract. Um, Mappings creates uh, a large table of voters who are like potentially in entering into this transaction. And then uh, you have proposals, which is an array that is everything you can vote on. And when, when a contract like this is executed, you need functions that um, give people the right to vote and like define what voting means. So in this very, very simplistic case, voting just means um, one item like one proposal gets an extra vote. Um, and this can be adapted to be more complex, like you could be voting for delegates that vote for you and represent you, and that can be written out in code as well. And in this case, I kind of like took some of that out to make it like a true democracy or like a liquid democracy. And then the final part of that like political structure would be just like counting the vote. So like all of the computers in the network who are nodes would have to run also like a winning proposals count. Um, so once a contract is drawn up, it can be deployed on the chain using um, a client that is running Ethereum virtual machines. So this is sort of what a client looks like. This is Ethereum wallet. And you can see like you kind of just paste in your contract code. It gives you options to adjust um, like different values that you've outlined in the contract. So in this specific example, like you can debate for a certain number of minutes about each proposal. And then a very important thing is that each transaction has a cost. So there's this like virtual cost um, that you have to provide like in a cryptocurrency to give miners an incentive to go and try to like solve the puzzle to get your transaction onto a block that gets added to this like ledger that everyone sees. So that's like the virtual incentive um, and cost. But there's also like a very real cost. So like the servers and computers that are running to like compute if this transaction should like be added to the blockchain also like consume energy. So there's this like weird parallel into the real world. Oh, and then the last sort of caveat is like, it's very important to like define where errors should occur in the contract. Um, and I'll talk about this uh, like later in the presentation because it's kind of a very important thing. Um, so this is a really exciting technology that spawned a lot of interest in the tech community. Um, tons of startups are in this space looking for ways to exploit or use or apply the blockchain to some kind of um, project, and a lot of them are financial. And this slide I've kind of tailored to be more like beyond uh, like explicit financial applications. Um, so some of the more interesting examples would be like, um, I think storage is a startup that tries to help you sell your extra space on your computer to other people on the chain so you can trade like unused hard drive space. Um, Transactive Grid is actually a company in Brooklyn that's really interesting. They're trying to help people um, that have solar panels sell their excess energy on the blockchain. Um, oh, and Colony. 
Colony is a really fascinating example because it takes people and allows you to sell, like people like us, I guess, and allows you to sell your like extra skills on the chain. So like if you're a programmer, but maybe you also know like Photoshop, you can sell your extra skills. Okay, so this is an example of a smart contract that I drew up for some invisible thing called Sunblock, which attempts to automate buying and selling of energy for uh, different types of users. So this is not a complete contract, but the basic outline is like, at the very top, I've created a contract for a soul. So like, um, if you want to sell and trade energy, it's really important to create also a token with which you can trade. So I've made up like a virtual token that people in this system might theoretically give each other, um, like to represent like some type of energy transfer or monetary transfer. And then the actual contract itself has functions for buying and selling energy um, that when they're called, also like check, they check the balance that you currently have, check the other person's balance, and then trades based on a price that's set. And there, there are like ton of other conditional things that I want to add to this potentially. Like for example, I added something called the sun because maybe like solar energy is limited in some sense. So you want to have like an initial supply that can't be changed, for example. Uh, and that leads me to talk about like dangerous consequences of this. So this is a quote from the Institute of Network Cultures. Um, and it's kind of, it kind of draws on ideas from this guy, David Columbia, who wrote a book called The Politics of Bitcoin Software as Far-Right Extremism. Um, and this, this quote is really interesting to me because I definitely feel implicated in it. But he basically says like lots of artists and designers are wanting to code smart contracts into projects, thinking that well, self-executing transaction technology is going to enable greater autonomy going to bring freedom and civil liberty to um, a larger number of people and that it appeals to us because of like this anti-authoritarian um, like ethos uh, but that we should be wary of it and I really like sort of the closing statement in this article um, with self-executing open source code so like with a smart contract um, the code actually becomes law for these transactions, and that can be very dangerous. You cannot like go back and revise the way a contract is set up after. Like once it's deployed, everyone can see it, and that's that's it. Like that's how people are going to interact with this. Um, and there's also this question of like, is decentralizing something like actually better, and why is centralization so bad? Because we like might not know what happens to this code once it's, it's out in this ecosystem. Um, so a good example of this is the DAO. So DAO itself stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And the DAO was the first of these organizations to appear on the internet. It was basically a community of people who were investing in different startups on the internet and contributing to this fund that existed on the blockchain. And basically what happened was um, one day $50 million just like disappeared because a hacker cloned the DAO and then put all of the funds in a different account that was frozen. Um, and this led to a huge philosophical crisis in the community because one of the like key features of the blockchain is that you cannot make changes to it, that it's like fully transparent and at the same time, like this company Ethereum really needed this system to work and like people were calling for them to undo this like transaction. And to describe this transaction like or like this theft more technically, what happened was basically some hacker went into the contract and saw that the withdrawal function on the account was happening um, at a place that like you could call that function before 
the account could would check the balance of it. So like you could just like make unlimited withdrawals without knowing how much money was in it. Um, so there was just like a lot of discussion and people were like, oh, well maybe we can exploit this loophole and then like try to steal the money back. But what ended up happening was they, they like undid the, the change. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with this quote from the Accelerate Manifesto, which um, I'll just read it. Like, we need to posit a collectively controlled, legitimate vertical authority in addition to distributed horizontal forms of sociality to avoid becoming the slaves of either a tyrannical totalitarian centralism or a capricious emergent order beyond our control. The command of the plan has to be married to the improvised order of the network, which I think is interesting when you think about all the possibilities of the blockchain um, and whether you actually need it um, for certain applications. So. Thank you.